Carr again. Okay, these are the qu Oh, hey, you, you're back. All right, let me, <laughs> let me find one for you. Okay, Amorosa do, you, Amorosa, do you anticipate more top officials in the White House defecting and speaking out against him? Well, Nikki Haley, she, I guess she beat the holiday rush and yes, got out did. there, right? <laughs> <laughs> she she you, saw the writing on the wall. Um, who, who's next? After the uh, midterms, when the Democrats take back control of the House and possibly the Senate, I think you'll see a great defection. There'll be a mass exodus, and everybody will be trying to fight to write another book or tell a story. So I worry about who's after, though. I mean, you know, the, the, we thought the first crew was bad, but I'm like, hey. I'd, I'd love. <laughs> no, 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 not you. I mean, I mean, like Rex Tillerson. You know, I th and then I, now I'm like, could we get Rex Tillerson back in there? For <laughs> Doesn't Chevron have someone who could step into that post? Uh, okay, Raihan, is the U.S. Army justified in its decision to discharge over 500 immigrant recruits in the last year? Well, if you're talking about, I think it's the MAVNI program, I think that it's just a... It's frankly one of these things that's less a policy decision than some kind of administrative cock up in which there just are a lot of different pieces to it. But I have to know the, the specifics of the case involved. Um, I do think that, what? you know, when there are folks who don't pass a background check and what have you, but I honestly don't know you specifically what you're doing. very careful to. on this show, right? <laughs> very, very careful. I used to be a lot less careful. Uh, Eddie, is free speech on campus being stifled with students protesting controversial speakers? I mean, what about that part of political correctness, that you can't speak on campus, the home of free speech anymore. I think it's overstated. Really? So, yeah, you, you can imagine uh, after Milo spoke at the, UCLA, he probably went someplace else and spoke without any, any, any uh, incident. You think about Charles Murray at Middlebury, he probably wound up, which he did at NYU the next day, so without you, any, in, without any incident. You, so You have to that, pick that, where you can speak? No, no, America? thousands, you, what I'm saying, there are thousands of lectures on college campuses across the ideological spectrum that happen Every day wow. without these incidents, what you usually get. I, I, you what, read a lot about it a lot. I know that's I, because that's because it's it's sensational. Just like you in your opening monologue, you talked well, about the weatherman. That guy, remember that guy in the weather report where the wind was blowing and the people were walking behind him and casually. <laughs> Sometimes we report about what's happening on campuses in a sensationalized manner. Okay, all right, uh, Steve. Uh... <laughs> when and how should Democrats address how badly they are polling with Latinos? That, you know, that is the, if there's one worry area for Democrats in terms of November, that's it right there. And I think one of the issues there is it's almost more fundamental. When we think of the Latino vote, often in the media and in politics, we treat it as, okay, immigration. And we think that is the major issue that's going to drive it. And we expect that, therefore, Democrats are going to get the lion's share of the Latino vote. And yet, it, there was a recent poll that said to ask Latino voters, what is your top issue? It was not immigration. It was the economy. Yeah. One third of Latinos identified as conservatives. A quarter identified uh, as Republicans. I think Ryan had the poll there from a couple weeks ago that had Trump's approval in, in one hitting 41 percent with Latino voters. I've seen it between 35 and 41 percent. And also you have a, a historically a low participation level, lower relative to every other group out there among Latino voters, especially in midterm elections. So if you're a Democrat and you're looking at California, Texas, Florida, a couple other districts around the country where potentially the Latino vote is going to make or break you, I think that's your biggest concern right now. You got the suburban energy. You got the money. I think that's a big factor for them. Okay. Um, Rebecca, why do so many liberals peg Melania as a victim rather than as a willing participant in a crooked family? God, I don't know. <laughs> it drives you me... You don't know. It, Even you don't know. It drives me bananas. Really? Because there is such, there's such an impulse to... I mean, maybe it's about the, you know, ever-renewing hope for white women, but maybe it's about that same impulse to think, to, to want to make a secret hero out of somebody next to him when it is so clear that Melania, Ivanka, these women are propping him up, deriving power, participating, par participating in the oppression and the destruction of the democracy. And I don't know, it drives me crazy when I see this. It, it, <laughs> I, there, there's very little that I loathe as much as, as the hope that, the, the idea that Melania is some kind of secret agent in there resisting. No, she's, she's as horrific as he is, with, le wow. less, with less power, marginally less power. 
Uh, Republicans are still chanting lock her up at Trump rallies. Is it necessary for Democrats to publicly distance themselves from Hillary Clinton, I guess this says Clinton, in order to move on from 2016? It's amazing the way they, they do still... Hillary is still like... But as if she was... As if she was president. We, uh, it's, it's... The idea that we could run away from the open calls to violent misogyny by distancing ourselves from one lady, you notice that they, they yeah, shouted it for... Matter. It doesn't yeah, matter. It's yeah. not about Hillary. No. It's about lock any of them up. You said in your monologue, it was Dianne Feinstein this week. Yeah. You know? It's lock her up. Lock her stands up. up. Stands in for a much bigger metaphor for what yeah. they want to do. Donald Trump's political method... One of his key methods is to try to turn a strength into a weakness. So when you look at the enormous enthusiasm you have on the left, you talk about angry mobs, right? You turn it into something that looks scary and threatening so that people will rally around it. And that's part of what makes him so effective. That's why he was able to cut down all of his rivals in the Republican primaries. When he has a rival, a clearly defined rival, then he can be very, very effective at trying to turn their strengths into weaknesses. And that's why when you have an actual Democratic nominee, that's the moment when he might become a lot more politically effective than he has when he does not have a clearly defined rival. Well, that and he might just need a new chant leader. I mean, I've attended these rallies when we were on the campaign, and there's a guy at the rally who leads these chants, and he just like might a need a warm-up act. Absolutely, he just might need a right. new playlist instead of lock uh, lock her up, lock her up. They might need something new to uh -huh. say, like lock him up, <laughs> lock Donald Trump up. <laughs> just, just the fact that we're talking about exactly. an American politician saying lock her up yeah. about just, anybody. Not it, just it's, an American politician, the most powerful yes, man in the world. In the world. It's right. It's so third world, uh, and and you know there's so many books called basically it could happen here. Right. I'm still surprised so many you, people. You also see populist politicians in pretty much all of the market democracies around the world who are gaining in prominence. This is not just a U.S. phenomenon; it's a global phenomenon, and I don't think we're seeing the last of it. I think we'll see more of it in the years to come. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, panel. <laughs> Tune in next week.